Thank you. It's always uh, intimidating when your introduction is more advanced than your actual presentation. Um, I, um, I come from an architecture company called Big. Uh, this is uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, this is our space. And um, basically, we believe that architecture should be the art of designing our cities and buildings uh, like man-made ecosystems. Uh, where we don't only channel the flow of people, but also the flow of resources uh, through our cities. Um, and you can say, like, the, the urgency for um, this sort of expanded role of architecture, you can sense in the atmosphere of this photo. Uh, it was taken at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change in uh, Copenhagen five years ago. And I think if you look at all of the world leaders, but especially Sarkozy, uh, you can see that this was not a celebration, it was a complete failure. Uh, none of the goals that were established for the summit were actually reached. And the general discussion about su sustainability was drowning in the misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our current quality of life are we willing to sacrifice in order to afford sustainability. So when we got asked to design the Danish pavilion at the Shanghai World Expo that was looking at sustainable cities, we thought, what if sustainable cities could actually sort of increase enjoyment and life quality uh, we designed the pavilion like a loop of a Danish streetscape complete with the blue bicycle lanes of Denmark and the Copenhagen city bikes. You could bicycle through the entire exhibition, uh, making it the ideal museum for impatient people, because you could, you could do the whole thing in three minutes without missing anything. Um, also, we, we tried to incorporate all of the elements of, uh, of Danish city life uh, including our first project in Copenhagen, which is the Copenhagen Harbor Bath. Our port has become so clean you can swim in it. So we recreated this experience that visitors could actually experience uh, how clean, if not how cold, uh, Danish harbor water tends to be. Um, also, we thought, how, how do we attract the Chinese to come and experience this? Um, we found a common denominator between Denmark and China is that in the public school curriculum, all Chinese people grow up with the story of the Little Mermaid, the national symbol of Denmark. So we proposed to bring the mermaid to uh, China for six months. Um, I had to go to the Danish parliament to argue her case, because the, the nationalists wouldn't uh, let her go, but as you can see, we got her. Uh, then we had to get her through Chinese customs uh, and, uh, and into the pavilion. Um, actually, in her absence, uh, we invited uh, the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei uh, to do an installation, and he installed a Chinese surveillance camera uh, in the pavilion, uh, the same camera that the Chinese state has installed in front of his house. Uh, but this was part of an installation uh, he called the Mermaid Exchange, so it transmitted a live image from China to where she would normally sit in Copenhagen, so the tourists going in vain would see that she was okay. Um, and also, it became like a loophole in the Great Firewall of China, the only uncensored live TV feed from China to the rest of the world for six months. So um, this was basically the first time we started working with this idea of, uh, of hedonistic sustainability. And you would say, like, ar architecture is really the art and science of accommodating life. It's like setting the stage for the life we want to live. Um, and what I'd like to do in the next... Uh, 28 minutes and 17 seconds, is to try to show you examples of what are, the, uh, what are the pieces of information that inform our design decisions, what are the forces that shape our world, in a way, how can we turn the constraints of the real world into the driving force of the design, almost like a zen-like way that you turn the force of your resistance into what drives you. Um, and I think one of the things we have is our climate uh, and our, our landscape. This is uh, Bernard Rudowski. He wrote a book in uh, 1964 called um, Architecture Without Architects and a short introduction to non-pedigreed architecture. Um, and basically, he had observed that all modern buildings were starting to look the same. Uh, and essentially, it was because buildings were turning into like boxes that were tube-fed uh, with mechanical services. So what used to be the job of the architecture now was suddenly delivered by machines. Like, so we need to see inside the building, so we make electric lights. Uh, we need fresh air, so we make mechanical ventilation. We need comfortable temperatures, so we make air conditioning or central heating. 
And suddenly the architecture was just, was just a dumb container, a tube fed with these machines, like a, a gas guzzling basement. And suddenly buildings started looking exactly the same, uh, no matter where you were in the world. And he was much more interested in what he called vernacular architecture, observing that all across the world, people had found ways of responding to the local climate and the local landscapes in ways that, was, that had sort of evolved really exciting uh, architectural languages. So essentially, like, uh, you know, different temperatures uh, generate different uh, building typologies, different wind conditions, uh, different landscapes. Um, and essentially, what we're trying to do is sort of rediscover what we lost with the international style and start trying to find ways of, uh, of making our buildings uh, respond to their, uh, to their surroundings. One example of how a building can respond to a climate is a, is a project we're doing for a uh, energy headquarters in Shenzhen, a, a subtropical climate in South China. Um, basically, build offices, they want daylight and views, but they don't want thermal exposure and glare. So by making the facade like a pleated dress, we open up completely to, uh, uh, to the north. We shut the, the sun out, so when you're looking towards the sun, you see these bamboo walls uh, washed in daylight. When you turn, you actually see sort of uninterrupted views. Within this logic, you can make openings for entering or like uh, executive meeting rooms. Um, so essentially, this organic uh, quality makes the building perform 30% better. You have spent 30% less energy on air conditioning purely because of the geometry of the facade. So in a way, what, what makes the building look different is also what makes it perform differently. Another way to respond to a warm climate and to make the facade express the climate uh, is by inhabiting it. We're doing a project in the Bahamas uh, where um, we're making these 15-foot, uh, very generous uh, balconies. Uh, the client wanted a pool uh, on every balcony. Uh, so instead of stepping up into a tub, we thought it would be nice if you walk down into, uh, into the water. So the pool is always located at the partition between the homes beneath it. So it starts sort of distorting the, the facade. In a way, it expresses the lifestyle of the home into the facade itself. And suddenly, the architecture is informed by the life that people live inside it. A, a lot of our work is somehow driven by how we sort of engage the public participation in the buildings. But, it, but in one case, we sort of turned it to extreme and actually experimented with crowdsourcing the design. Uh, these images were taken in, uh, in Copenhagen during what we had in Denmark, which was called the, the Mohammed cartoon crisis. You might remember that a provincial Danish newspaper commissioned 10 cartoonists to make fun of the prophet Mohammed, uh, showing how free we are in Denmark. They pissed off one billion uh, Muslims, uh, in, including all of these boys. This is in front of our office in Copenhagen. They were very angry about this. So we got invited to do a, a, a one kilometer long urban space in Copenhagen uh, in the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. There's more than 60 different nationalities. So we created what we call the, the red square, where everything is, is red, uh, the black market, uh, where everything is black and white, um, and finally the, the green park uh, as the last part of it. And then we thought this project has to be all about ownership and integration. So rather than seeing integration as a problem, we saw it as a resource. We reached out to the entire local community via social media and via meetings. We had the local newspapers. And we had people recommend elements from their other home country. And the logic is that this is not about political correctness. We're not eating Chinese food or Indian food to be nice to the Indians. It's because sometimes we crave curry and, uh, and we, have some, we need some Indian food. So, we, we put a Moroccan fountain in, in Copenhagen, not to be nice to the Moroccans, but because they have an amazing heritage of, uh, of architectural water features. So when, when you look around, it becomes like a safari. There's an outdoor sound system from Jamaica. Um, there's uh, like a Thai boxing arena from Thailand, obviously Iraqi swings. You have litter boxes from Great Britain, bollards from Ghana. You have the bicycle racks from Finland. All of these are things that don't exist normally in Denmark, and they're like way cooler than the stuff we have. The sign on the Red Square is actually a sign from the Red Square in Moscow. Uh, this is a bus stop from, uh, from Kazakhstan. It's like way cooler than a typical Danish bus stop. 
we found uh, an elephant slide in, uh, in Ukraine. We actually had to make a copy because the original was radioactive from Chernobyl. Um, even down to the manhole covers, uh, they're from uh, different cities in the world. Uh, we found palm trees in China that actually grow in a, in a Danish climate. Um, this octopus is from Japan, and you can really see on the kids playing there that it brings the different communities uh, together. When you look at the benches, it becomes almost like a cultural study. This is a Mex Mexican bench, a love seat, where two people look at each other into the eyes. Uh, a Belgian bench where everybody looks away from each other. Um, <laughs> so you have like these sort of uh, amazing exotic artifacts from, uh, from different cultures. They're like everyday objects, but, but here they suddenly represent the true ethnic diversity of, of contemporary Copenhagen, even down to the lamps. Uh, we have a series of neon signs that advertise things you can't buy in Denmark. So this is a Qatari dentist. Um, and of course, on the red square, some former Soviet and socialist uh, uh, neon signs. We made an app so that you can actually get all of the stories, like who, who recommended this, where is it from, how does it fit into, uh, into the space. So it's really turning crowdsourcing into the driving force and also creating a, an urban space that really has the diversity of, uh, of the neighborhood. Of course, history can also shape a building. This is a Hamlet Castle Kronborg. Uh, it was recently turned into a UNESCO World Heritage. So the Danish Maritime Museum that used to be inside had to go somewhere else. They suggested, why don't you put it in the dry dock where we used to build ships? So we suggested to, in a way, turn the dock inside out to use the museum as a way of preserving the dock. All we have to do is design uh, three bridges. Uh, one that stops the water from coming in, one that connects to the castle, and then one that takes you into, uh, into the museum. Um, we could also build the bridges uh, in a shipyard in China as big steel vessels and then sail them in and click them into place. So basically, like the, um, we also solved this dilemma that basically the UNESCO said that we had to stay completely underground not to block the view of the castle. Uh, the museum directors wanted some kind of architectural masterpiece. Uh, so by turning the museum inside out, we could actually create this exciting void uh, that a discovery would actually be sort of descending along this sloping bridge uh, into a museum. Then you sort of continue your descent, and uh, the spaces go from very intimate to being like very vertical and narrow to being like almost the size of a cargo bay of a ship. And in a way, the architecture becomes like this collision of the, of the old and the new. You see the lightness of the glass and the steel colliding with the heaviness of the concrete of the dry dock. You have an anchor chain that is actually part of the structure of the building. So there's no theater, there's no scenography. It's all hardworking elements in the architecture. Steel bridges that span. Uh, this is the grown-up auditorium where the, state, uh, where the seats of the, of the grown-ups continue to become the, the children's auditorium uh, underneath the stage. The canteen where the, the, the dock it continues inside, almost like a Roman ruin uh, in the middle of this like, uh, modern architecture. And I really like this idea that you have this coexistence of the historical castle, and then from the horizon and down, it's like this very modern contemporary experience. This is me and my girlfriend performing an inverse Titanic moment. Uh, <laughs> Like, I also realized that a lot of our work in Copenhagen is actually underground. We recently completed a sports hall uh, for my old high school. It's in the middle of the courtyard, and it's a handball hall. And uh, we got the commission from my uh, math teacher. So uh, the rules of uh, handball means that you need 15 feet on the perimeter and 30 feet in the middle of height. So we based the architecture on the mathematical formula for a ballistic arch. Uh, so when you look at the glue lamp beams in the ceiling, they're actually shaped by the geometry of a, of a thrown handball. In a way, it's the mathematics of the sports that creates the, the landscape. And then suddenly, the, the necessity of, of underground creates this informal uh, mole uh, hill, almost like that has become like this inviting piece of furniture in the middle of the courtyard. That in a way, the imprint of the sport suddenly has this uh, social impact in the, in the courtyard. Like a, another thing that can drive a design is the synergy between the different ingredients of a building. 
Uh, we've done a building in Copenhagen called The Mountain. It's like an homage to a Habitat uh, 67 here in, in Montreal. But essentially, it's creating uh, 100 homes, turning it into a mountain uh, of houses with gardens. Everybody has a garden the same size as the, as the house they live in. Uh, but it's in the middle of, a, of an urban context. It's made possible because they're sitting on top of a big parking structure that serves the entire neighborhood. We have a funicular elevator that gives access to all of the apartments, almost like imported from Switzerland and brought to the flat topography of, of Denmark. And to make the, the parking naturally ventilated, it's wrapped in a perforated aluminum uh, facade that brings daylight and air into the parking. But by varying the size of the holes, from a distance, it turns into a gigantic urban artwork completely for free. It's simply the, the transparency that creates the illusion uh, of an image. So we've called this idea architectural alchemy, that you can create added value or gold, if you like, by combining different ingredients. Um, we did a building in, uh, in Copenhagen uh, that's like at the end of the city limits. This lake is where the city stops. Then you get like uh, other life forms uh, on the other side. And essentially, we try to use the synergy between the different programs. There's shops and offices. They like to be close to the customers on the ground. On top, we start adding different layers of, uh, of living. Uh, townhouses with little gardens. We start uh, distorting the volume to optimize views and access to daylight. And suddenly, it becomes like this warped uh, figure eight. Uh, and not only can we sort of optimize the conditions for, for each of the programs, but also we can expand uh, the social realm. Instead of being restricted to just like meeting your neighbors on the ground, you actually create a three-dimensional urban condition uh, in the middle of an otherwise uh, rather flat uh, city. So you have like uh, people playing and biking all the way to the 10th the story penthouse, um, where, the, where the eight house uh, intersects itself. All of the amenities are connected in this uh, bouncing uh, uh, atrium that connects all of the facilities from the ground to uh, a shared roof terrace. And it, it really becomes an expansion of the landscape of Copenhagen. Copenhagen is completely fat, as you can see. And now there's actually a place where you can go and enjoy the view of, uh, of your city. Normally, I get the complaint that this only works in sort of semi-socialist Scandinavia. Uh, but we're actually uh, taking some of the ideas to New York. We're doing a project in Hell's Kitchen, uh, sandwiched between a power plant a sanitation garage, and the West Side Highway. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty rough location. And we thought, actually, to the right is the courtyard building where my dad grew up in uh, Copenhagen. And in a way, the Copenhagen courtyard is at the architectural scale, what Central Park is at the urban scale, an oasis in the middle of the city. So we asked ourselves, what if you combine the density of a skyscraper with the communal space of a courtyard? Or essentially, what could a court scraper look like? Um, so basically, we, we put the courtyard, we give it the density of a skyscraper, um, it preserves uh, access to sunshine and views over the water, and suddenly we get this striking new silhouette on the, on the waterfront of Manhattan. From the east, it looks like a spire. When you enter inside, the, the, the courtyard has the same proportions as Central Park, only it's uh, 13,000 times smaller. And then it really goes from the height of a handrail in one end to the height of a high-rise uh, in the other. It's, uh, it's currently under construction. It's going to be complete in a, in a year and a half. Um, and essentially, like having arrived uh, in America recently, we, um, we got invited to, uh, to come to Canada uh, in Vancouver, uh, right where Granville Bridge touches uh, downtown Vancouver. Uh, we got invited to look at a site that was being tortured by the Granville Bridge and its tri-forking uh, bridges. Um, sort of as an example of how the constraints can actually liberate you, we simply just started mapping all of the constraints, all of the setback requirements. There's a 30-meter a setback from the bridge because the city wants to make sure that nobody looks at the heavy traffic. There's a setback so we don't cast shadows on the park. And suddenly, we're left with a tiny footprint of a of 6,000 square feet, almost too small for a tower. But then we were thinking, if the, 
if the 30 meter setback has to do with a minimum distance, once we get 30 meters up in the air, we can actually come back out, complete the rectangle, double the size of the floor plate. So when you drive over Granville Bridge, it's as if someone is pulling a curtain aside, sort of welcome to, uh, to Vancouver, almost like a genie coming out of a bottle. It, um, it reminded us of, um, of the Flatiron Building. The Flatiron in New York is a, a product of this moment in Manhattan real estate history where real estate value uh, elevators and steel structures suddenly make a silly site into the landmark of a whole neighborhood, except we're sort of taking it one step uh, further. <laughs> and also underneath the, the bridges, we're trying to sort of turn the canopy of the bridge into an asset. We're working with the Canadian artists to create a 16th chapel uh, of street art, sort of upside down under the, the bridge, turning it into this, uh, this new striking public space. And actually, almost as an anecdote for, the, for TELUS, the uh, Canadian cell phone company, we're doing a building that is almost like Vancouver upside down. Uh, it's not because we ran out of ideas, but it's because uh, it's essentially the, the parameters of an efficient office building that blends into a slender uh, residential tower, uh, becoming a, a single silhouette. So in that sense, it's, it's always interesting in, in each case to try to sort of play with what are the ingredients that could really generate uh, a genuine idea. Uh, and maybe just like Vancouver is an example of how a bridge or a piece of infrastructure can shape a building, um, sometimes the building can actually become a piece of infrastructure. Uh, we're doing a small art museum in Norway in a sculpture park, and uh, the sculpture park is divided on two sides of a river. So we thought maybe the, the museum could actually become the bridge connecting the two sides. So uh, now when you walk through the park, you'll arrive into um, a stack of galleries with skylights, and then the, the skylights sort of turn 90 degrees and become a pan panoramic view of, uh, of the mill and the river. And in a way, what starts happening is that it becomes this strange hybrid that it's, it's a museum, but it's also a bridge, and it's also a sculpture. You can almost see it as the biggest sculpture in the sculpture park, Depending on where you see it from, you might not even suspect that it's a building. You, you might just think that it's a, like a, a really big piece of, uh, of sculpture. So this, this brings me to the last sort of category of, of ideas that I'd like to talk about, is, is what we've called social infrastructure, uh, this sort of hybrid between uh, infrastructure and, and social amenities. Um, as, as you probably know, like, because of global warming, uh, the sort of Atlantic hurricane belt is expanding. Uh, so suddenly the east coast of North America is being pounded by more and more hurricanes. Uh, Sandy was like devastating because of the funnel shape of the New York Bight. Um, it, it sort of uh, increases surge threats and it puts 50% of New York City at, at risk. Um, so we were invited to look at the aftermath of Sandy. So here you see some of the images of the devastation. Uh, also, Sandy gave rise to uh, the genesis of a whole new neighborhood in, uh, in Manhattan called uh, Sopo, south of power. Um, and essentially, if you look at the historical map of uh, Manhattan, you can see that since the 17th century, we have steadily been reclaiming land from the sea. And essentially, the land that we have created ourselves is also the area that now needs extra protection. We need to take greater responsibility for the space that we have created ourselves. So how can we make this resilience infrastructure without creating a barrier between the life of the city and the water uh, around it? In a way, learning from the High Line, the High Line in New York that turned a decommissioned train, uh, like rail, rail yard, into what is now one of the most popular park promenades in the city, this idea that maybe you don't have to wait for the infrastructure to get decommissioned, Maybe you can actually design resilience infrastructure that comes with nested uh, social and environmental amenities. So imagine like uh, landscaping that is actually also what protects the city from, uh, from being flooded. Like it could be various kinds of uh, art pieces or various kinds of interactive designs that, that performs the resilience infrastructure. You can imagine the median of the West Side Highway becoming landscapes to also uh, taking uh, any kind of flood threat and protecting the city behind it. 
On the east side, uh, we're looking at uh, basically creating a, a, a landscaped uh, hillside that protects the park from the noise of the highway and protects the city from, uh, from flooding. Currently, you have these caged bridges that bridge over the, the highway. In the future, it'll be these smooth, open landscapes. We can resolve all of the access for uh, accessibility. Uh, we sort of remove the bicycle lane into the sort of peacefulness of the, of the park. Uh, we extend the life uh, of the city into the water, creating a harbor bath on, the, on 10th Street. Um, and under the, the FDR, we're imagining to create a series of pavilions with uh, galleries and, and markets that are sort of forming um, a sort of a, almost like a, a chain of interconnected pavilions. So in the case of a storm, huge sliding doors can come out and, uh, and, and enclose the, the front. Also like learning from Vancouver, we're proposing these uh, artworks underneath the FDR that can flip down to accommodate temporary markets, but also really become the flood protection in the case of a, of a storm. And for like a 100-year flood, all you need is actually four feet, the height of a bench. So par part of the infrastructure is just going to be this like, almost like an undulating uh, bench-like element. And then for like 500-year storms, you can actually have the, this like, bench serve as the infrastructure for deployables. And finally, in the parks, just by playing a little bit with the topography, we can create a, a barrier. We're proposing a harbor school and a sort of cities on the water museum uh, at, the, at the bow of, uh, of Manhattan. And we like this idea of, a, of an auditorium that looks almost like an inverse aquarium. It looks in and sort of shows the different water levels and, and, and almost like the museum that deals with the issue also becomes part of, a, part of the solution. So uh, the basic thinking is like using social infrastructure as a way of actually intensifying the life uh, on the waterfront, and in that process, protecting the life of the city uh, behind it. Maybe just to finish off, just to show that this is not science fiction, uh, we're currently building our biggest project to date in, uh, on the waterfront of Copenhagen. Um, and it's not going to be a royal palace or a, a cultural palace. It's going to be a waste-to-energy power plant that turns uh, household waste into electricity and, and district heating. Seen as a resource, our household trash, actually like one ton of trash equals one and two thirds of an oil barrel. So it's a very rich uh, resource. But of course, they are ugly big boxes. They cast shadows on the neighbors. They block the views. Uh, this is going to be the biggest and tallest building in all of, uh, uh, of Copenhagen. Uh, it's going to be right next to the marina and right next to where the local boys go water skiing. And, and speaking of skiing, uh, in Denmark we actually have snow, but we have absolutely no mountains. Um, but, you know, we have mountains of trash. Uh, so we were thinking, uh, currently you have to go six hours by car to uh, uh, Isabel in the south of Sweden. Uh, because of the sheer magnitude of this building, uh, we can actually do two-thirds of, uh, of Isabel on the roof of our power plant. We know how big the machines are, so we can create like this nice uh, loopy turn. It's a 300-foot drop. Uh, we install an elevator, and then you have a, a black, a blue, and a green uh, ski slope. So basically, instead of having a visitor center where school teachers drag the children to force them to listen to how waste turns into energy, people will just go skiing, and then they'll gradually be curious about what's going on um, inside. This was a competition, and we were like, we were pretty surprised that we were that we would win the competition. But now we now we have to figure it out. Also, just to um, <laughs> also just to give you an idea, uh, this is the roof uh, of the ski uh, slope. Uh, it's actually uh, twice the length of the Sochi half pipe uh, in the Russian uh, Winter Olympics. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty significant uh, slope, and I don't know if you. Uh, you, you know, obviously Canada dominated uh, the Olympics. Denmark got zero medals. Uh, but uh, this is going to change because from 2017, <laughs> we can actually practice uh, at home. Uh, we have this amazing hybrid landscape of, of uh, vents coming from beneath and uh, skiers on, uh, on top. Also, in the summer, there'll be like uh, trekking paths. It's going to be like an actual public park where people can enjoy uh, the landscape, the, the spectacular views of the, of the flat city. 
Um, also, we're going to have the tallest climbing wall in the world, 300 feet uh, of uninterrupted climbing. It's going to be insane. Um, the facade uh, has planters that filters light, uh, daylight into the, into the factory. And also, like, this is going to be the, it's going to be the, you, you can say, like, some of the ideas I showed in the beginning about trying to see our cities and buildings at, as man-made ecosystems is very close to coming to completion, because not only do we locally harvest rainwater, uh, natural daylight, uh, natural ventilation, but also together with the city of Copenhagen, it forms uh, an urban metabolism, like an ecosystem. It's also going to be the cleanest waste-to-energy power plant in the world. Uh, the smoke that comes out of the chimney is going to be completely non-toxic. It will contain a little bit of steam and a little bit of CO2. Um, so we were thinking how to deal with this. And um, you know, one, of the, one of the main drivers of behavioral change is knowledge. Um, Act, like knowledge always precedes action. If people don't know, they can't act. So uh, we've designed the chimney in such a way that every time there's an emission of one ton of CO2, it puffs a gigantic smoke ring. Um, and the thing is, like, nobody understands what is a ton of CO2. It's intangible. It's, it's confusing. So there's no information to inform our, our decisions. But, uh, but if you come to Copenhagen in 2017, all you have to do is look at the Copenhagen sky. We'll be projecting our CO2 emissions, uh, and you'll be able to understand exactly how, how much and how frequently uh, do we emit uh, one ton of CO2. So uh, in a way, like trying to sort of continue and almost like literally manifest uh, one of the many sort of elements in, in our everyday life that we can use to... Uh, to sort of drive uh, our designs and, and to create, uh, really create the world we want to live in. Thank you.